message about a person named Fannie Lou Hamer. Most of the time during Black History Month, we celebrate people like Martin Luther King, or uh, Rosa Parks, sometimes Malcolm X. Sometimes the schools don't even want to celebrate Malcolm X. But a brother named A.J. Taiba last year, he challenged us to take it a little bit further. Right? We need to celebrate more people. We need to understand more about what this struggle was about. Right? And with this being a election year, I feel that it was really important for us to bring this specific person up, which is Fannie Lou Hamer, yeah. because she went through a heavy struggle in Mississippi. If y'all saw Mississippi burning, y'all know what was going on in Mississippi and why it's important for us to go out there and vote. Y'all see the results of our vote right now. Many of us did not go in and vote after Obama got elected. We felt that it was all good. We felt that, you know, that we had a victory of some sort. And then we didn't even vote in the midterm election. And look, they took the whole Congress, they took the Senate, and they took Obama power away. So we have to vote every election, especially local elections. Right? Yes. So this is, a, this, is, this is the story of one person that <laughs> fought very hard for the right to vote. And her name is Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was born in 1917. Fannie Lou Townsend Hamer rose from the humble beginnings in Mississippi Delta to become one of the most important, passionate, and powerful voices of the civil and voting rights movement. And a leader in the efforts for greater economic opportunities for African Americans. Hamer was born October 6, 1917 in Montgomery County, Mississippi, the 20th and the last child of sharecroppers Lewis, Ella, and James Townsend. Uh, she grew up in poverty, and at age six, Fang Hamer joined her family picking cotton. By age 12, she left her school to go to work. In 1944, she married Perry Hamer, and the couple toiled on the Mississippi plantation owned by B.D. Marlowe until 1962. Because Hamer was the only worker who could read and write, she also served as the plantation timekeeper. In 1961, Hamer received a hysterectomy by a white doctor without her consent while undergoing surgery to remove a uterine tumor. She was forced, she had a forced sterilization of black women at the forced sterilization of black women as a way to reduce the black population was so widespread it was labeled the Mississippi appendectomy. Right? So this it's a lot in this story, so we gotta we gotta flesh it out. Um, what we a lot of us don't know, if you read a book called Medical Apartheid, is that they was doing a lot of experiments, experiments on us as black people during slavery and outside of slavery, right? So they were forcing people, as far as black women and men, to be sterile in the South because they didn't want us to increase in numbers after slavery. So this is something that she went through, and she was not able to have children. All right, so. Unable to have children or of their own, the Hamers adopted two daughters. That summer, Hamer attended a meeting led by civil rights activist James Foreman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Anybody know who the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is? SNCC. SNCC, right? So SNCC are the, are, the, are the youths that were in college at that time that you would see sitting at the counter at Woolworths that was going to all of these different places and basically breaking the color line when these all these whites only places in the South. They were the youngest people in the Civil Rights room, Movement that had to fight to be recognized, all right? And uh, James Bevel of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Y'all know who the Southern Le Christian Leadership Conference was? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who was that? That was the ones who was rolling with Martin Luther King, right? There was a, um, a group of ministers that became the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So she was rolling with them as well. Hamer was incensed by the efforts to deny, to deny blacks the right to vote. She became a SNCC organizer, and on August 31st, 1962, she led 17 volunteers to register to vote at the Indianola Mississippi Courthouse. Denied the right to vote due to unfair literacy tests, which is another way that they denied us the right to vote. They would make sure, they would, when you come in there to try to vote, they would ask if you could read the Constitution or recite the Constitution or guess how many jelly beans was in a jar. And if you couldn't do these tasks, then they said that you wasn't able to vote. Right? Um, so denied the right to vote due to an unfair literacy test, the group was harassed on their way home, and the police stopped the bus and fined them $100 for a trumped up charge that the bus was too yellow. So they pulled the bus over and they said that the bus was too yellow and that was enough for them to get charged. Right? 
That night, Hammer was fired by the plantation owner, right? He basically told her, listen, if you don't go down there and rescind your right to vote, you have to leave this plantation, right? So she was not able to work. But her, her husband, she, he had to stay on because if not, the family would have no income. So she had to act, basically leave her husband and her children on the plantation and move on. And ever since after that, when I saw the documentary, she's been, she been moving and traveling ever since with SNCC trying to organize the right to vote. Right? Okay. This works. Uh oh. <laughs> Hello? You hear me? Yeah. Oh, my voice is better. Yeah. Which one? My voice is better. Okay. So, all right. In 1963, after successfully registering the vote, Hamer and several other black women were arrested at, for sitting in a whites only bus station restaurant at Charleston, South Carolina. At the jail her, at the jailhouse, she and several other women were brutally beaten, leaving Hamer with lifelong injuries from a blood clot in the eye, kidney damage, and leg damage, right? So in the documentary, Fannie Lou Hamer said that she was placed inside a prison cell, right? And the officers had two black males in there who she called Negroes. The officer gave the first Negro the, um, the, um, what he, a blackjack. And he told him to beat her until he cannot beat her anymore. And that black male beat her and beat her and beat her until he was tired. Then he gave the whipping stick, the, the blackjack, to the next black male, and he started to beat her. She started kicking uncontrollably. And what did he do? He forced the other black man to hold her legs. And now he beat him, she continued to beat her until she started to scream out. And as she was screaming out, she, the officer came inside and started to punch her in her face and told her to shut up. So this is why she fought, she faced these and, and suffered from these injuries, right? But that did not stop her. In 1964, Hamer's national reputation soared as she co-founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the local Democrats' party's ethics efforts to block black participation. See, what y'all don't realize is, is that we only been Democrats for a little while, right. right? Because the party of Lincoln was the Republican party, right? Sometime during the New Deal is when the Southern Dixiecrats moved over into the Republican party, right? But us, we never was Democrats. We just became de Democrats over the last century. Right, so what she founded was the Freedom Democratic Party because the Southern Dixiecrats did not want black people voting in Mississippi. So she was able to organize that party. All right. Which, okay, so Hamer and the other MFDP members went to the Democratic National Convention that year arguing to be recognized as the official delegation. When Hamer spoke before the Credentials Committee calling for a mandatory integrated state delegations, President Lyndon Johnson held a televised press conference so she would not get any airtime. But her speech, with its poignant descriptions of racial prejudice in the South, was televised later. By 1968, Hamer's vision for racial parity and delegations had become a reality, and Hamer was a member of Mississippi's first integrated delegation. Right? So she was able to actually get seated on the floor in Congress and be the first black woman, along with the other people that she was running with, to step on that floor. In 1964, <coughs> frustrated by the political progress, Hamer turned to economics as a strategy for greater racial parity. In 1968, she began a pig bank to provide free pigs for black farmers to breed, raise, and slaughter. A year later, she launched the Freedom Farm Cooperative, buying up land that blacks could own and farm collectively. With the assistance of donors, including famed singer Happy Belafonte, she purchased 640 acres, launched a coop store, boutique, and sewing enterprise. She single-handedly ensured that 200 units of low-income housing were built. Many still exist in Ruleville today. So she's not the only person that did this thing with the pig, as much as I don't eat pig, right? But this is something that they were doing. It's called, it's called um, micro, micro finance, right? So what they would do is, 
she would she invested in these pigs. And when a young person was coming up that wanted to uh, start their family, she would give them one pig, right? And they would take that pig, and after the litter comes in, she would have, they would have to give her back two of the pigs, right? And then, you know, invest in somebody else to get a pig. And that way, the wealth is spread. Maybe on a small level, but you don't realize so much stuff can come from having at least one animal. So now you can start your farm. Black right? This is black economics. Yeah. And we can do this on a micro level today. Right? If we just invest in each other, she was able to get all of that land, distribute it to a family. She felt that every family should be able to have some land and a house of their own. And this is what she invested in, and this is what she taught. And she also, you know, as she did with the Senate and the government, she forefathered them for the right to vote. Because Mississippi, the, the area where she was living in was 70% black and only 30% white, and they never had anybody in the black, any black people in the government. So how is that, right? So these local elections, the community board, the assembly, the, uh, uh, all, of, all of these city officials that's around here, especially in Harlem, in all of these areas where we live at, it should be people that look like us in these seats. So this is why I'm bringing up Fannie Lou Hamer, and I hope y'all understand what I'm trying to talk about. If you, anybody got any questions? All right, well, that's what I wanted to bring up. Thank you.